Hoffman, a faculty advisor from Cal State LA for both the Baja and Formula team. I'm making a quick video here on uh, overall vehicle design. This is something I find is a difficult aspect for many of the teams and often separates some of the top teams from the middle of the pack, especially in the design events. So let's talk about some of the metrics to think about. So I kind of broke it down into 10 metrics in three different categories. The first being, you just got to finish the race. Uh, to do that first, you have to be able to get out onto the track and so you have to meet all the rules. The car needs to not break down throughout the race, needs to be reliable. You know, in addition, you know, if you do finish the race, you need to do it as fast as possible. Uh, big things there are things like the grip, power, mass, lift, drag. Uh, so I think those things are a lot of the key elements that'll affect, affect, your, affect your performance. And the last is, you know, you might have a car that, that has, you know, incredible performance, but, you know, you need to actually be able to deliver on that performance. And so your driver needs to be able to, you know, control the vehicle. And so that'll come into, you know, can they, can they, you know, easily steer, shift, you know, are they comfortable? Is, are they well supported in the seat? You know, how is the balance of the car? Is it oversteer? Is it understeer? Does it feel unstable? Um, all of that will co come largely into play uh, in terms of your overall performance. And so in all of this, uh, you really need a, a good team that can integrate all of these aspects, you know, with both their driver and a strategy really to perform at the highest, highest level. And what do I mean by good team here? And so what I mean is first, you know, you have the right people. So you got to do, you got to do recruiting. You got to maintain your members. Uh, you should have, you know, clear goals as a team, create a plan uh, to, you know, achieve those goals, uh, have, have a structure of your team and have a schedule. And then you need to track your schedule. Uh, I think the last part about the good team is, you know, you need to be cohesive, right? Everyone needs to be working towards those same goals. Um, so I think really the, you know, the teams that can integrate all of these aspects with a car, a driver, and a strategy are the ones that really are doing well. So let's go into a little more detail into, into some of these different aspects. So the first that it meets the rules, right? So I think the first thing you need to start by doing uh, is really reading the rules in depth, right? It's a really open-ended problem. These will really help you define define the problem. You know, you know, what does the track look like? You know, for example, here I show you the track. You know, what speeds will you be traveling at? Uh, what's allowed? You know, so can you go to a wheelbase of 50 inches? You know, so I think really understanding the rules will really help you understand the limits of your design and really help you in the design process by limiting a lot of the possibilities. So, so and off, you know, don't forget to revisit the rules as you go. Uh, I've read them numerous times and, you know, I still need to revisit them all the time. So definitely before you go to competition, have an alumni or someone, someone not on your team inspect your design and the build of your, build of your car to make, sh make sure it passes the rules. Um, they'll be great at catching things. Uh, a lot of times often the, you just have the person who made it inspect it. A lot of times they're going to they're going to let a lot of things pass that someone who's not in, invested in that design uh, would say, no, this is not going to fly. So, you know, do all the practice you can before you get to competition. There's so much going on, right? So perform all of these tests before you get to competition, make sure things are working well. Um, you don't want to have to try and fix these things while you're there. So the last part is be ready for the technical inspection. So uh, you sh your car should be ready to roll into the inspection uh, first thing in the morning. So I can tell you the number of times I've seen seen my my teams. And, you know, we just have to you know put this guard on or put these body panels on, put this zip tie on, and pretty pretty soon that turns into a couple hour couple hour jobs because they they didn't realize <laughs> realize what it would take. And you know, all of a sudden now we're crunched to get in to get through inspection on the first day, right? So you can see in this picture here too, there's a lot of people, not only around the cars, but back out here as well. And so what that is, is not only do you wanna have a plan for who's gonna be in there, you know, they should be very knowledgeable members about all the different subsystems. They should be, you know, uh, very familiar with the rules, but also who's gonna be ready with what tools. Um, is there someone, you know, in your trailer, or in your truck that you got a walkie talkie to so they can, so they can roll, you know, run over some tools if you need or, uh, you know, spare part. And even the people uh, in the inspection should have a couple of simple tools, a couple of screwdrivers, zip ties, some tape, a little padding. 
just so that they can make minor fixes right there and don't get hung up in because um, really you know in the end passing tech early was really going to set you up for for a good dynamic day um, i mean a lot of the aspects of the competition are you know what order are you going to do the different events are you first in line for the different events so keep that keep that keep that in mind and just remember that the judges are volunteers of course too and so and so you know they're they're not out they're not out to get you at all they're out to make sure you're you're being safe so you know it's okay to have a you know intelligent conversation about the rules if you know them well um, but i'd say you know pick and choose what you're going to spend a bunch of time arguing about if you're going to argue about trimming off your zip ties flush you know that seems like probably not a good use of your time uh, they you know, if you think your frame passes the rules and they think you need to cut it and weld in some new members, okay, well, maybe having a thorough discussion to make sure the rules are being applied correctly would make sense in that case. So, so yeah, uh, nothing will get you hung up and really be a bummer for the whole year, like not getting through tech inspection. Trust me, it's happened uh, to my teams before. So next thing is being reliable, right? Um, we've all been in the place where, you know, we would have only done this if it wasn't for this one little thing that we forgot. So. Trust me, everybody's in that boat. So, so you need to find a way to keep yourself out of it. So anything that can go wrong will go wrong in these competitions. So the best way is to be prepared. Uh, so no, nothing can state how valuable testing, testing is in terms of if you really wanna perform well in the competitions. It was gonna highlight all of your weaknesses right off the bat. The big thing with testing too, is when something goes wrong, don't think, oh, it was just, I didn't tighten down the bolt quite tight enough, or it was a you know a slight material defect. Find the root cause of the problem. There's there's always, uh, in my experience, a root cause that once you find it, uh, will solve will solve it. But just by remaking it exactly the same again and crossing your fingers, that almost never seems to work. And like I'm showing you some pictures here. The bottom right one was actually an example of where we took us forever to find the root cause. So this is from Baja. We had some really high angled uh, U-joints and we kept our uprights and our rear kept failing. So we gusted them to make them a lot stronger thinking, oh, we just didn't design the uprights right. And then all of a sudden, all of our U-joints started breaking. And what we eventually figured out was that we are having interference issues with the U-joints being at too steep, too steep of an angle. And so we went through a lot of, a lot of iterations just to, just to find the, the root cause, uh, which was actually a rather simple, just geometric interference issue. The other thing, don't design for a factor of safety just over one. Your decision for your factor of safety is based on how much risk are you willing to take for, for a failure versus you know, how much extra material are you willing to, to put there in terms of which will increase your cost and potentially decrease your performance. Um, and it's also based on how well do you know that know the different loading scenarios? You know, do you know what the forces are? Um, are there combined, you know, combined loads that you need to take into account? How well can you translate those different forces into stresses uh, inside your part and being able to identify you know where those stresses are highest? Um, so all of that, all of that, all of that goes into goes into your selection of factor of safety. And uh, I would say you know unless you're really test unless you're really testing the part with known lo known loads, you should not be you should not be driving you know uh, down anywhere anywhere close to even 1.5 or so. So. Um, but that's something your team should really be deciding. So, you know, as always, don't put your material in bending. Bending is, bending has two things. The big thing is that you're applying a force a, far away from the material and your material has a much smaller thickness than that distance. So it's like a lever arm uh, on that material and you're not using the center of the material. So you're not even using all of your material to hold the bending load. Torsion is similar. It doesn't use the center in general. So you, most of the time you want to, Go big diameter and uh, big diameter and get the material out away from the edge and the material in the middle doesn't do much to help you. The other thing is just do things right the first time, especially in terms of manufacturing. A uh, number of times that you just say, oh, we're just going to slap this weld right on here real quick and put it on there and I'll fix it later and it never ends up getting fixed and it ends up taking 10 times as long or oh, I'm not going to make a jig. I'm just going to hold that in place while I, while I weld it. And, you know, you end up cutting and welding it, you know, 10 times, or it ends up breaking a more critical part. So those are my suggestions for being reliable. Here on the bottom left, I show a, a rod end and bending, uh, which broke a number of times on us. Uh, 
So keep, keep that in mind. So the next I wanna talk a little bit about grip. So I was a little hesitant to, to show these numbers um, because one, they're specific to our car and they're specific to a certain track and it's just for a point mass simulation. But I figured I'd show just some rough numbers just to give you orders of magnitude of importance of these different kind of performance metrics. And so the, for every 1% increase in grip laterally, we'll have about a 0.35 reduction in lap time. And this was for an endurance track. Um, and for any longitudinal grip, it was about 0 0.05. So you can tell the lateral grip is much more important. And the reason why the grip is so important is you can look on this um, GG plot, which is basically acceleration, acceleration, velocity plot. Most of this is actually limited by your tires all the way up to where you see it, this base starting slanting back. So this is all about grip where your traction limited. It's not until this phase where your propulsion limited at these high speeds. And so your performance at most speeds, you know, average speed of, you know, 10 to 15 meters per second in formula are, are governed a lot by traction. So you see these have a big effect. And your traction is uh, governed a lot by your tires and your tire selection. And, you know, are they at the right temperatures? Are they at the right pressures? Are you keeping them at the right angles, both statically and, you know, dynamically through uh, roll, pitch, heave, um, you know, all the different, all the different uh, modes of motion of the vehicle. So, and the other thing is, you know, keeping the uh, normal force and contact variation from kind of the, their optimal values to a minimum. And what that, from optimal, all that uh, in general means is keeping keeping the the normal forces spread out, uh, and so and you don't want them oscillating either. And so uh, and by spread out, you want to kind of keep them spread out equally amongst all the tires. And so I show up down here some data from the Tire Test Consortium, which you should definitely sign up for as an FSA team. And more and more Baja teams, I think, should start looking for some tire data to help inform their decisions. But this max normalized lateral force, you can think about this like a lateral coefficient of friction. So that's why it's unitless. And you can see that as the downforce increases, you actually get less and less grip. And so you'd rather have all your tires with you know, 200 pounds of downforce, let's say, rather than have you know, some with 150 and some with 250, because the 250, most of your downforce is weighted over here. And so your average would look a lot like the 250. So you can get a better grip if you more evenly distribute the forces. And you also don't want them varying. In addition, I plotted in blue just the slip angle where you reach this max. And you can see that uh, this is a function of your downforce as well. Uh, and it increases, it increases for a while all the way up to, you know, probably beyond what you typically have on one tire. And so this might help you select if you want to do uh, Ackerman or anti-Ackerman. I'd love to see more data on this. I haven't seen a lot of a lot of data, and I hear arguments from a lot of people with experience that, you know, Ackerman is the best for these autocross type circuits and FSAE. And then you hear about more high speed racing where they talk about, oh, anti Ackerman to set up the, you know, optimum slip angle at all the tires at the same time. So I'd love to see some data. So if you're listening to this and, and you've thought about this and have some ideas, you know, help teach us about that. Um, so the next was power. And so you can see this, uh, this value is on the order of the longitudinal grip in terms of its effect on lap time. And this is very affected by your arrow. The more downforce you have, the more the, the more power you can put into the ground. So you'll see this number change. So, you know, how do you think about the power in these cases? So, you know, FSAE, uh, you're limited by your restrictor in these cases. And so you have a lot of design in terms of the plenum, the runner, timing of the spark, timing of the fuel injection, uh, timing of your intake valves opening and closing, all of that, right? Um, to try and limit the effect of, of that restrictor, as well as your exhaust design. Baja, Baja, your, so I show Baja power curve on the left here. Uh, thanks to Zips Baja, they showed this and they had some kind of nice data, which I think is cool because it's also very different than what Briggs and Stratton provides. Not very different, but it is different. Um, so, and so Baja, yeah, you're a little more, you're a little more limited here in terms of terms of what you can do, but you can do a lot in terms of getting that power to the ground, which is what actually matters in the end. So on the on the right, I show the actual force, which is what you care about, traction pushing you forward versus versus speed. And you can see that, you know, initially you're actually limited more by traction. Uh, and then 
you come down and you come down along, this is maximizing the power basically. And depending on the number of gears, that'll depend you know, how close you can stay to this max possible. And so Baja's usually the CVTs, which keep them nice and nice and close, nice and close here. Um, so, and, and kind of think about, you know, how much power do you need? Are you willing to trade off having a lot more, having a lot more mass for, for more power? And will that actually affect your, affect your lap times in the performance? So the next one is to think about mass. So this has a, a little bit bigger effect than, than the power, but has a, a little less than the grip. So, uh, and this, you know, I think this number for a, for a point mass simulation is probably rather off. So I think there's probably a bigger effect than we're actually thinking about here. So, uh, so, and you should be tracking the mass. Uh, I think you were looking for places where you can make large gains, right? So there's, there's, there's no point in shaving out ounces to get down to really low factor safeties in some areas if you just have wasted mass in other places. And don't just think about the kind of the linear mass, but you also have rotational inertia in your systems that will affect your times as well as your moment of inertia. Cause you actually, you know, to make a turn and to turn 90 degrees, you actually need to yaw your vehicle. You can't, uh, so that getting the ma all the mass close to the CG as possible and getting it as low as possible and reducing the rotational and inertia inertia of the system is all important and tracking will help you make, you know, make more significant gains than just, just having, you know, some sections, some sections super light and other sections just carrying around bricks. So a couple of just concepts to kind of reduce, um, to be able to reduce masses, you know, spread the forces over large distance within the chassis. Um, that'll make things, uh, that'll make things stiffer and it will reduce the, reduce the forces on certain areas of the chassis. You want to hold, hold moments with links that are perpendicular to kind of long moment arms um, to minimize the forces. So for example, like a you know, toe link on a, maybe a rear tire, right? You want to have a, a long moment arm and you want um, you, about which the tire turns and you want to have your, have your link go in perpendicular to that moment arm uh, to, decrease, to decrease those forces. And same thing like an upright, you know, it's nice to have your upright nice and tall because that'll spread the forces over the you know the upper and lower control arms rather than have them super small where then to hold any moments you need really high really high forces so so spread the forces spread the forces out over distance and keep your moment arms perpendicular that'll help reduce the reduce the loads you know always designed for tension and compression direct shear loads fed into triangulated nodes uh, when you can or even tetrahedrally nodes um, to just keep anything out of bending and this will help you make your parts much, much lighter and stronger. You know, go take a, go take a stirring straw or a toothpick and, and try and pull it apart and uh, see if your intention and compression, if you can break it and then go and try and bend it, you'll see how much weaker it is. So in all this, right, is a trade-off with the reliability, right? So um, how much, how much risk are you willing to take just to, you know, get a pound out of, out of your car? So I think, you know, here's an example I show on the bottom of one of our Baja lower control arms. And you can see that, you know, we tried to do some lightning holes one year and they're filling with dirt anyway, so how much lighter they make it, but, you know, potential reason for the cause of the cause of the failure there. Um, so uh, it's another thing to keep in mind. So going, you know, this is pertains a little more to formula SAE than it does to Baja, although there are teams that are uh, taking into account the drag of their vehicle and in Baja. I don't think I've never I've actually seen one talked about lift, but that would be that would be actually interesting at some point. Uh, so here's, and so you can see that these have about the same order of magnitude as, uh, as like your longitudinal grip, uh, things like your power, uh, but you know, these num be skeptical of these numbers because these were even put in for this kind of cool paper where they looked at different, different styles of arrow and the different potential drag coefficients and lift coefficients. Of course, you know, the, you know, these simulations, you know, should be validated before you'd completely take them into account, but just to give you some rough, rough numbers to put in here. Um, tends to be interesting too, if you kind of throw these into a lap time simulator, you can actually see that, you know, going to a higher aero package does, does help your lap time significantly uh, if you can do it. But uh, keep in mind, um, one, this was numbers from 
a computational simulation. So uh, it could be over predicting things like lift and under predicting things like drag. And then this all goes into a 1D simulation, which you know assumes that you can operate at the edge of your grip envelope. So you know, keep in mind, you know, can you actually, you know, deliver on this predicted performance? Um, and then you also think, you know, your team has limited resources. So, you know, you don't, there's something, you know, you need a drivetrain just to finish. You need your suspension just to finish in general. You don't necessarily need the aero package. So if you have, you know, a team with limited resources, maybe this is not the, maybe this is not something that you prioritize, but maybe, maybe it is. So that's the decision for your team. And you, can, you don't need a full aero package. You know, maybe there's certain elements that are, that are, easier to integrate or things that you need and you know a nose cone for example and you also got to think about integrating your aero design with your cooling and they should actually you know you got to integrate it with the whole vehicle right i mean it's got to be you got to be crosstalk with your suspension and your chassis um because uh it will change a lot of the things about the the balance and performance of your car especially um especially if you try and you know go for these really high down really big wings uh to really try and get some performance at these low speeds because you know you most likely you're watching this know that these lift and drags are related to the velocity squared and so their their effect at the this average speeds of 30 miles 30 to 40 miles per hour are not super big so moving outside of kind of just the raw performance metrics which you put into a 1d simulation a lot of just practical aspects of your car that will have you know potentially even larger effects on your end performance you know just in terms of can your driver control the vehicle um, can they operate all the all the shifting anything else that they need to adjust while they're driving uh, while also steering all at speed and doing these quick turns you know have your drivers been practicing events that are very similar to what they're going to see uh, or is during competition going to be the first time your driver saw it you know, does your driver fatigue throughout endurance? You know, are they sliding around, getting tired? Uh, that'll have a huge effect on their on their performance. You know, I show a couple of examples here on the bottom left of of a steering wheel, where you can't even actually turn it all the way around without you know having to shift your hips around. Uh, so that's that's going to be quite the to shift your hips around and shift uh, and shift gears and turn all at once, and that'll be quite a quite a uh, quite a feat for the driver. The right, I show kind of an interesting case where there's a CVT, so there's no no shifter, so it's relatively easy to drive, but the but the seat doesn't have much support for the driver. You've got uh, exposed exposed uh, exposed bolts that they're going to be riding around on, and so your driver is going to be sloshing around, getting tired, not feeling comfortable, and so because I think in the end, you know, a driver that feels feels safe and feels in control is going to be much faster than than a driver that feels like this car is about to fall apart under them. Next thing I wanted to talk a little bit was a little bit more about the details of vehicle dynamics. So uh, these include things like the balance of your car and stability and control. So balance is like uh, understeer and oversteer, for example. And so some of the ways which we think about this is I'm drawing just a, a bicycle model of a vehicle and I'm showing the slip angle of the front tire and the slip angle of the rear tire. And so let's say this car is slightly angled to the clockwise direction, but its velocity is traveling straight up. So this angle that we call beta, so that's the vehicle slip angle. And you might use the steering to put some steering input into most likely your front wheels. Um, and so this uh, delta here is your steering input. And these slip angles, the difference between your velocity and this delta will give you the force on the front and the force on the rear. That with you know, knowing the downforce types of tires, pressures, angles, all that stuff will get fed in to get these forces. Um, so if you wanna learn more about this, we have a couple different workshops which go into a, a lot more detail. But as you can see, because there's a larger turn or slip angle in the front, it'll have a larger force than in the rear. And this will cause this thing to rotate clockwise, which is important when you're driving around a turn because your car actually needs to rotate by 90 degrees as it goes through that turn. So you need some yaw uh, in that, in that direction and this moment will cause a yaw acceleration right and so not only do we usually think about cars in terms of their you know acceleration acceleration like gg plots versus velocity but you might also look at their yaw acceleration versus lateral acceleration and you could also do this at different velocities if you wanted to um, and so the first thing we think about is these two 
forces will add together to give you your grip. How much lateral acceleration can you get? And when you're at these peak lateral accelerations, is your car tending to, to yaw more or yaw like more clockwise or yaw more counterclockwise? That'll be your balance. And so in this case, because you're yawing more clockwise, more into the turn, that's going to be an over, you're going to be oversteer. So anything kind of above this would be oversteer, um, which will usually uh, result in, you know, a little bit quicker cars, but a little, little less stable. So the other metrics to go into is this stability metric. And so stability is the slope, this red line, and you want this to be uh, large and negative. And the way to think about that is that you keep the steering of it uh, fixed so at zero, and then you increase the vehicle slip angle. So you rotate it compared to the velocity that it's going, and you want the vehicle to rotate back. So if you have some disturbance and your vehicle moves away from the, its velocity vector, you want it to rotate back to it. And so having this be large and negative will do that. Moving on to control. So the way to think about control is that your vehicle slip angle is zero, but so you're going straight, but you're slowly increasing, increasing the steering input. And so, and what you want is you want that to cause your car to yaw. And so that means your driver, when they put in some steering input, their car is going to respond well to it. So they have control of their vehicle. So you want that to be um, high and high and positive. So like, for example, right now we're operating in a regime that's up in this, in this area. We have, we have some steering input. We also have some vehicle slip angle. We're moving the yaw acceleration is clockwise. So like positive axis would be clockwise and we're moving to the right. And there's an envelope that this, it's limited by. So as you go through the turn, you usually kind of go up into this, reach your peak grip, and then you're going to come back to zero and zero while you're traveling down the next straightaway. So these are some these are some aspects to think about. All right, so let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. So first, we'll look at the balance, and this is whether your car is, is kind of neutral in steering, if it oversteers or understeers. So Oversteer will be that your car actually turns more into the turn than you would expect from the steering input of the driver. And you'll actually see as the lateral forts get larger and larger, they'll actually have to back out of a turn. So sometimes you'll hear the announcer say, a, you know, during racing, a snap of oversteer, and you'll see them have to turn back out of the turn real quick to get control of the car. Or you'll have understeer where your car will actually be, won't be turning as much into the turn as you want. And you'll kind of drift out to the outer edge in a turn. And as you turn in, you're going to put in more and more steering input as the lateral forces, as the lateral acceleration gets harder. And so this has a lot to do with the relative grip of the front to the rear axle. Uh, so if you have more grip in the more grip in the front than you do in the rear, you're going to you're going to oversteer. And then if you have less grip in the in the front than the rear, then your front's not going to make the turn. Uh, and so you're going to have some understeer. And so this is affected a lot by you know your tires. You know, but are they the same everywhere. What's it's a lot about your suspension? The LLTD is like your lateral load transfer distribution. So that's one metric we use a lot. We use to think about it. Think about the balance of weight transfer. And typically, typically what you find is if you have one axle with a lot more weight transfer than the other, that one's going to lose grip, and so that could cause over or understeer. You know, your steering will have an effect on this. Your center of gravity location and your differential will even have an effect. And so. Uh, Baja, they don't think about this as much, but you know, one aspect that I see a lot in uh, I see a lot in Baja is they use a spool for the rear, and because they use a a spool which doesn't have it's not an open diff, it's kind of like a lock diff, it's usually going to cause a lot of understeer. And so to counteract that, I see a lot of teams will make their rear track width really small. They'll also use stiff shocks in the rear, or they'll use a stiff anti-roll bar, and that'll help them kick out that rear when they're doing the maneuverability event to be able to get around a lot of the obstacles. So um, the other thing to think about is, you know, the stability, right? So if your car car yaws a little bit, does it continue to yaw, right? That would be really discomforting as a driver or does it, you know, return back to going straight again? And this has a lot to do of the kind of some of the moments in the front and the rear as it moves away. And so, you know, because of aero, you start to lift up the rear at, rear at high speeds you know it might start to might start to shake shake a little bit and so sometimes you'll see you know that's why they'll put the flaps on the back back of the you know some higher speed cars than what we're talking about here it's just to keep the keep that downforce on the rear tires so that they can still you know contribute some forces to turn it back if you imagine like in this case if if you have a lot more forces in the front as it turns away that's going to turn it that's going to turn it 
uh, continue turning it away from the velocity vector. Whereas for stability, you want more of the force to be back here on the rear tire so that when it goes away, it turns it back. So the control right, how much does it correspond to a steering input? You want your driver to feel safe in the control right, so that'll um, that'll you know be a big effect on your actual performance. You know, in the end, how much does this stuff actually have an effect on your lap times for different drivers, right? So um, we could spend you know as long as we wanted in the design process thinking about all the details, but you know, really in the end, how much how much does it have an effect on your performance? And so you know, tracking some of these things. Uh, and seeing how it affects lap time is important. And I think understanding some of the concepts to know how to kind of tune things in different directions is also important. But you know, you don't want to get paralyzed in the design process either with all the different things you could be doing. I'm just going to show a couple of just quick graphs. So here's an example of one that I put together for a very oversteer car. And so you can see that the balance is positive. But you can see that this makes the vehicle slightly unstable. So the VS is the vehicle slip angle. So this is zero. This purple is also zero, so this is the steering input being zero, and then here's the vehicle slip angle increasing. Here's the steering input increasing along this vehicle slip slip angle, and so you can see this this is a little bit unstable, but it's going to be very darty, and it's got a lot of control. Versus if we did kind of the opposite, we made a a very uh, understeer vehicle, and you'll see that you'll be very stable, and you'll lose a little bit of control. So the last little bit, as I talked about, you know, the different aspects of the overall vehicle design, but what about kind of the process you should take? Um, so I think a very important thing is to your team to start off by setting, setting your goals. Is your goal is just to, you know, get in the top 10, top three, or is it, you know, hey, we just want to complete all the events. Um, and, you know, we want to, you know, have a, have a year where we build the team and, you know, we, we enjoy the process and learn a lot. So you know, different teams will have different different strategies and that might affect, oh, you know, should we push all of our factors of safety down super low and go super light and risk breaking, but go for go for high performance? You know, should we, you know, have one or two of our lightest, most well-trained drivers, or should we, you know, anybody who works a lot on the car be able to drive right? I mean, so a lot of these things will go into, and I've had teams take different strategies uh, on this process on on that. Um, and so, and then I think you start off with your goals you come up with your vehicle overall vehicle requirements that support your your team's goals and then you'll have your subsystem requirements uh, which will support your overall vehicle requirements so they all kind of build and overall requirements right you might start with you know your event performance and then you know go down into things like we talked about today the grip power mass lift drag and footprint you know where's the locations of all your tires kind of these big picture things and um, there's a ton of different ways to design a car, design a car, but you know, in general, for a lot of these cars, the uh, forces at the contact patch are what drive your car around uh, the track for the most part. And so, getting getting your tires in the right place um, is really important and at the right angles. And so, typically, a lot will start at the contact patch and kind of work their way in. So you start with the suspension, steering, brakes, all controlling controlling the tires and drivetrain, and and then you know you work your way into uh, uh, aero and chassis, but you know of course the more forces that you start talking about from aero, the more priority they start to have. And then once you have an idea for the chassis, you're thinking about you know driver positioning, controls, and you know and all of these have a big effect, right? So they're one, so you need to figure out how to prioritize them, and you're probably gonna have to iterate and integrate all of these things together. Um, none of these processes are as linear as we as we imagine. So with that, good luck in uh, your build. Check out some of our other videos. Uh, and feel free to feel free to reach out. Thanks. Boys, I'm a fool for you.